Uh, thank you, Mark. Oh, look, firstly, um, our sort of issues with smoke uh, at a golf tournament pale into insignificance to, to the, th the things that homeowners and people, property owners and, and people right around the country have dealt with. So we're, we're very aware of, of that fact. Um, and uh, you know, all our sympathies and thoughts go to them uh, because that's, that's the real issue uh, for us. Uh, this week, it has been a little bit different um, the first couple of days. It's not something we've really had to give consideration to before. We've had storms and rain and hail and uh, heat and cold and all those sort of things are your typical golf tournament issues. Uh, but this one is new. We have been in uh, constant contact, particularly with the uh, Bureau of Meteorology. Um, and the, the, the outlook is, is really optimistic. At the moment, I believe we're having a westerly wind and that's that's the worst wind we can get in terms of the smoke but that is due to change later this evening uh, there's southerlies and then potentially a northeasterly uh, that'll that'll come in and they will clear the area which i think is is not just good news for us but also good news uh, for for the people of sydney and and surrounding areas so um uh, I think that is uh, really positive but it's a situation we'll continue to, to monitor um, I know you want to make some other opening remarks and then we'll open the floor to questions after that. Yeah, uh, look, we're really excited to be here this year for the 104th Emirates Australian Open. Uh, we've, I think, got a terrific field this week. Uh, we're in the second year of the All Abilities uh, Classic, which is just a, a wonderful initiative. Um, we were so pleased with how it went last year. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, become a really important event very quickly and the field for that event is, is also really strong. So I think on both fronts we're going to have a great week uh, of golf um, and kicking off what's going to be a terrific summer of golf in Australia and that's really important for the game to help grow the game and, and put some uh, drivers back into grassroots golf and hopefully get a golf club in the hands of, of more people around the country. We'll open the floor up to questions. Cathy can run the microphone. Rod? Stephen, obviously there's a multitude of issues that face the game. You've touched on one there, the growing of the game and getting clubs into kids' hands. Professional tournaments have some role to play there. Beyond that, what does Golf Australia have to help make that happen? Um, yeah, look, professional tournaments do play a role, but they're a small component of it. I think in Australia... We've actually had a really strong correlation between success at the highest level and strength at grassroots. And if it goes right back to Greg Norman and we can chart the, the growth of Australian golf on the back of his success over a period of time and, and more recently with Kari and, and, uh, and Minji and the girls and Adam and, and Jason probably winning majors in the guys. Um, but beyond that, um, as I said, it's only one component for us. The program's designed to get clubs in the hands of, of kids, of women and girls, of, of new golfers is really important. For us, the My Golf program that's a joint venture uh, program with the PGA is a really important program and it's in six years of being a PGA, uh, a PGA GA joint venture, the numbers have grown from about 4,000 kids to nearly 30,000. Uh, and I think that's a really strong growth over a period of time. Um, I always had a view if we could get to 30,000, then you've actually got something meaningful that is a really good platform to grow the game into the future. Uh, we will launch this summer Get Into Golf, which is a, pr a program designed to, to connect people of all ages with the game of golf. And we've got some pretty ambitious targets within that as well. We're looking to try to get uh, about 10,000 people in the first year hooked in through that program and then to grow it from there. We're um, running some programs through government uh, called Better Aging uh, and that's a really important program. Uh, that's, if you think about Australians living longer uh, and trying to stay healthy and active longer, I think golf is an amazing vehicle to help achieve that. So look, they're the main things. Uh, look beyond that, we've been fortunate that we've had so many great players and, and great players performing well in recent times at, in both the women's and men's games uh, and I think that holds us in, in good stead and they've been wonderful ambassadors not just for golf but also for Australia. So I think those components leave us well positioned. Can I have a follow-up? 
obviously the next step after you put a club into a kid's hands is them having somewhere to play. We've got issues with public golf, it would seem, growing in Australia. Public courses closing. Private clubs have their own issues to deal with. Is it the responsibility of Golf Australia? And if it is, what sort of plans might you have to ensure that there are public access courses available for those who want to enjoy the game at all levels? Yeah, look, I think, I think we've got to do a better job of bringing public access facilities into the fold, and there's been a fair bit of work done on that. But th that's one component of it. I think the bigger piece of work is working with our, our own clubs uh, to making, making sure that they're more accessible to, to children and also women and girls beyond that. Uh, we're running a program called Vision 2025 um, and uh, it's designed to make golf more attractive to women and girls um, and to really make some, some material change by the year 2025. Um, so for us, uh, I think clubs have come a long way in terms of being more accessible. If you went back 20 years, juniors were just ignored within golf clubs. Now, there's, there's probably some clubs out there that still aren't doing a very good job in that area, but there's a lot of clubs that have changed significantly and have got a much better longer-term view on their role within growing golf in this country. So I think we've got to continue to drive that outcome, and I think that in concert with um, probably offering a more coordinated service to, to facilities and not just courses, but driving ranges, I think are really important within growing the game. Even putt-putt and things like top golf and those sort of things uh, all make up the, uh, the mosaic of, of what golf is and I think they're all really important. So we've got to do more to, to build those relationships too. Brendan? Stephen, just following on, following on from that, there's more than a million golfers in Australia, but it seems like the, the, the big problem is converting them into golf club members. What's the feedback that you get from working with clubs as to why it's such a, such a, a trickle effect through to becoming a club member? I, I think you've got to be realistic and look at the big picture of Australian sport. And what we're experiencing within golf is what's happening across Australian sport. So membership across organised sport in this country is under pressure and is declining. And what's happening, there's an emergence of less structured sporting options. Uh, and I think as in terms of golf, you've got to be able to adapt to that. And I actually think golf has done a pretty reasonable job in that space. We may be slow at some times, but if, if you look at your typical semi-private club, 20 years ago, their revenue model was probably something like 80% member, 20% uh, non-member. Now, for that same club, it's probably 50-50 or even 40-60. So clubs have adapted their business model. From our perspective, we'll always be trying to get golf club members because we think that is the ultimate uh, because they're the rusted on people that have made a, a really tangible commitment to a club and to the game, so we always think there's value in actually doing that. But you just can't ignore the casual players out there who, who may never be a member of a golf club but have a love for the game. So one of the things that we're doing in the next 12 months is building our capability to talk to, to casual players, and we've got targets of growing that by 50,000 within the next six months. Um, and I think as an organisation, we've got to be able to communicate with them and engage with casual golfers, even though some of them may never be club members or certainly have a period where club membership doesn't appeal to them. Bernie? Stephen, um, we're only a few weeks away from a new decade, but when you look back on the last decade, what sort of stands out in terms of um, the impact of Australian golf? And when you're looking for, say, a golfer of the decade, how far, you know, is Adam Scott, is he a standalone? In, in terms of his master's win, is that? <laughs> That's a, a great question. Uh, let me think about the first part of it first. Um, Bernie, look, to me, probably the best thing we've done is my golf. I know it's still growing and it's still got a, a fair way to go. It's not, it's not rivaling Auskick at this point, but if you look 10 years ago, that space was really fragmented. PGA were running their own program, we were running something different. Um, so to, to bring the organisations together and to do something around junior golf, to me, is, is really important. And I think 
as we grow that, as it gets over 30,000, hopefully towards you know, 50,000 kids, you've got a really strong platform to grow the, the game into the future. Um, uh, the golfer of the decade, that's... Uh, <laughs> Um, wow, that's a tough question, Bernie. That's a really tough question. I mean, I think Australians will never forget uh, what Adam Scott did at, at the Masters. That had been such a an area of heartache and near misses for us, and I think that was such an important moment in Australian golf. Um, and you know, to get to world number one, and um, so I mean, I think he's certainly right up there. And I think the other one. Although she hasn't won a major, if you look at what Minji's done in the amateur space and then turning into to the professional world, uh, she's been just so dominating. So they'd probably be the two that I that I think. Um, and if you went the decade before, it'd be a lot easier because we could all agree on probably Kari. Um, but um, the last decade, probably Adam and Minji would be the two that probably edge the others. Stephen, Mark Panowitz, how are you? Good, Mark. Good. Have you had any word back from the sneaky greenkeepers yet on how the course is going to be set up and do you expect some uh, pretty serious scores out there? Um, and what's the condition of the course? Oh, the condition's really, really good and I, I'd pay uh, acknowledgement to the, to the course and the course staff because they've had really tough conditions. As Anyone that lives in New South Wales would know it's been pretty uh, bad conditions for presenting a golf course in, but it's, our people were up here... Well, they've been up here a lot, but uh, even a couple of weeks ago, the, the view was it's going to be absolutely perfect. So um, we're, um, we're very happy with how the golf course has been presented. I think the Australian's always a really fair test. Um, so there's not some of the dangers that you can get in terms of setup that you can get elsewhere. And it's not as exposed, say, as uh, New South Wales or even the lakes, where we've had a few challenges with wind. So I think we should get um, a really good event. If you think back here, you know, this golf course can play really, really tough. Uh, the round that stands out to me is probably Jordan Spieth. Uh, Mark, what? 2014. 2014, his 63 in that final round. Uh, when Rory said, I could have played the golf course 100 times and not shot that. Um, so it, it can be set up really, really tough, but I think the great thing about the golf course is it, it's tough but still fair. If you play well, you can score well here. Back to Rod. Sorry, not to harp on this, but I, I, to clarify, one of the things I was getting at earlier in terms of public golf, we've, we've lost uh, Hudson Park here in Sydney, Vic Park in Brisbane is on the chopping block. I wonder what you feel is the responsibility of Golf Australia in that space uh, and what might be able to be done? Is it is it time to get proactive in approaching councils about the facilities they have and making sure that they're sustainable? Okay, yeah, I'm with you, Rod. Um, yeah, I do think we need to be... Proactive is the word I would agree with. Um, so for us, and we've actually invested in this area, it's one of the, the benefits of the One Golf process that we're going through. We've put some resources into this area. We've been, uh, I think, a bit reactive in this space. And if you think about golf courses around the country, particularly in Sydney, um, there's some that are under challenge. Uh, and for us, the thing we want to do is actually help clubs before those challenges arise. And from our perspective, we're always going to have challenges. We have 1,500 golf clubs. I think that makes us the third most golf courses per capita in the world. You know, I think Scotland's one and I think England is two. So we're right there. So it means that from time to time when you've got so many golf clubs per capita, you'll have areas where there's, there may be a glut of golf clubs uh, and the market you know, makes it hard for them to, to succeed, particularly if costs are rising. So from our perspective, it's how do you help clubs before they get in those situations? How do we... Uh, stand up to councils and tell councils about the great things that golf does. Environmentally, we've, um, I think, become a terrific sport in terms of how we handle environmental issues, sustainability of golf courses, the flora and fauna now that are on golf courses often are, are much better than uh, what's available in parklands. Um, I think just the health and well-being aspect for people, keeping people active, uh, and mentally and socially engaged in, late into their lives is really critical. So it's how we, we work with councils so they understand that message and understand all the good things that, that golf does uh, rather than focusing on some of the bad things. So I do think 
we've got a role to play in that space. I think ultimately we probably need to communicate well with our members, our 400,000 club members, about uh, their role in doing this. And the two messages I would, would like to, to really start delivering to our club members, one is to share the game more and bring, let's bring more people into this great game of ours because it, it makes people's lives better. Uh, and secondly, uh, let's, let's show governments and councils that we, we're passionate about our golf and engaged with our golf and that we want golf to be treated well by governments and we want governments to partner with golf. The very slim Ben Everill. <laughs> Mate, uh, how much of a concern, if any, is the, I guess, declining win percentage on the PGA Tour for Australians and uh, membership rate as well? Like the next level has not sort of kept up with past numbers. Um, look at, I guess you always look at those sort of things. From our perspective, the main metric we look at is, is transition rates and what our what Australians are doing in terms of how they tr transition from amateur golf um, to professional golf. And right now the rookie program, and, and Brad James can talk uh, about this more in depth, the transition rates are, are pretty good, we're ahead of the curve, and that's the whole purpose of the, the rookie program, to, to safeguard athlete transition uh, and to make sure uh, players don't go backwards or, or don't stunt their development through sort of negative practices. But having said that, um, I think there's still probably some areas we'd like to see improvement. Um, there's been some players that we thought would probably be further along the line than, than what they currently are. So that's always something that, that our coaches look at internally. Are there things that we can do better in this space? I mean, the US tour for us will always be critical because it's the biggest, most prosperous tour in the world. Um, I think having said that, we feel like we do have a good crop of young players coming through and we've had some good success. Now it's just making sure that they're going to take the next step and get, for us, top 100 in the world is really critical. That's, that's where, if you look at the data, that's where major winners generally come from. Uh, the more players you have in that top 100, uh, the better off you are for a range of reasons. So for us, that's always the, the ultimate target. And if you look at the last, say, 10 or 15 years, there's been times where we've had more players, both men and women, in those, those top echelons. Right now, I think we've sort of t got three in the top 50, both men and women, um, which, is, which is pretty good, but we'd, we'd obviously like more. Steve? Steve, uh, geographically, what's the future of this championship looking like beyond the current arrangement with the New South Wales government? Uh, we still, I guess, have the luxury of having uh, the, the arrangement with New South Wales Government till 2023, including that championship. And um, the deal we've structured the last time around, I think it was an excellent deal in that it just gave us a little bit more flexibility. So for the first time since 2006, um, it will be held somewhere else in Australia, so down at Kingston Heath uh, next year. Um, not that... Sydney hasn't been a wonderful home. It's been incredible uh, sort of 13 years here in Sydney. Um, and then we're in uh, Victoria Golf Club in 2023, 2022. Sorry. Um, then beyond that, there's a, a bit of water to go under the bridge before we're in a place where we can start working past 2023. And we, you know, as I said, we have a wonderful relationship with New South Wales government. Um, if you had your sort of utopia, you'd like to see it move um, somewhat. I think a long-term anchor tenant and then having the ability to move it. So it's a little bit like we've done in this current arrangement. Take some pressure off the courses in that anchor state and also I guess to showcase it around. I mean, we look at uh, the Open Championship and the US Open, the way they move those events around and there's obviously some real value in doing that. But our ultimate aim is to make sure the tournament is healthy and prosperous and coming from a really strong brace, uh, base and that's our first priority. Is that realistic though, what you Say that, that again, Steve, sorry. Is that realistic though, what you're uh, mentioning about potentially having a base but then touching other parts of the country? Oh, uh, look, I, I think possibly. Um, contractually, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of how we handle that process and um, you know, obviously a lot of respect with the New South Wales government in terms of the partnership that we've had over a long period of time. But I think, yeah, I think it is 
potentially possible. It, it's not always easy, and even this time around, to actually achieve the art years wasn't an easy process. Uh, but we have done it, so I'm really happy about that. I think it's a good result for the for the championship. Um, so it, yeah, look, it's it's not easy, but I think we're. It's probably more realistic now than it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago, where it was a lot more cutthroat. I think governments are a little bit more uh, happy to work cooperatively on something like this. Last one, Brendan. Steve, um, in an upcoming interview that's not yet published, Keith Pelly says he would love the Australian Open to be part of the European tour schedule, but there are stumbling blocks not from them, but from elsewhere. Do you want the Australian Open to be part of the European tour? Um, I would say we're definitely open to that uh, prospect. We couldn't have done it, for example, last year. We clashed with Dubai. So dates become a major issue in terms of the tour sanctioning as well. Uh, from our perspective, the key thing in driving the tournament is, is players. We think that that's held... Uh, the tournament in good stead over the last 10 years. We've had a great list of players who have played the tournament, won the tournament. Um, so tour sanctioning, the thing we're looking for is a, is a tour partner that can help deliver the best players in the world. Um, and, uh, I mean, European tour certainly does have some, uh, some good players on it. And I think it's, um, it's obviously been part of Vic Open, which is something that Golf Australia runs now um, on behalf of Golf Victoria. It's been part of the PGA. So I think it's, I think it's a possibility, but um, I, I wouldn't, couldn't make a commitment at this point, Brendan. Don't, don't you think it would, be, would further benefit the tournament, the value of the tournament, if you know, uh, one of the young players that's out here today, out, out, out here this week, if it was a European tour event, they've got something else to play for other than not with no disrespect to the Australian Open, but it, it gives them some sort of future. Whereas if they win this week, they get the trophy and the check. If they win two weeks' time at the PGA, next year's all sewn up and they've got somewhere to play. Uh, look, I don't think it's quite as simple as that. And I, the example I'd use is Cam Davis. Um, and there's a nice graph that I'll show you of Cam Davis's world ranking and there's a line where it drops like that and that's when he won the Australian Open. But the opportunities that winning the Australian Open uh, created for him were pretty immense. So it's, it's not as, as black and white as you, you get a ticket onto the, onto the European Tour and you're all set. And sometimes that works and sometimes it, it doesn't quite deliver what players hope. Um, but on the, on the flip side, if you look at Cam Davis and he's the perfect example winning this tournament opens up an enormous number of doors and does give you um, some opportunity to pursue. So it's not quite as simple as that, um, I'd say.